Good morning. Good morning. So glad we get to be here together. Thanks for, thanks for showing up. And I hope that you don't have an emotional uh, issue since yesterday went rough on, on a certain team. And anyway, we're going to continue in the series called Guardrails. Man, by way of review, this is a, a series based on the the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are um, the establishment of the vows that would govern a divine relationship between people and God, right? When God began to speak the Ten Commandments, he's speaking it to the, to the Hebrew people, and he's saying, I want to make you a nation. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. Let's do it together. Let, let's be intentional. Let's walk in this. And, and if we're going to have a healthy and a good relationship, here's how we do it. You need to take no other God and allow him to be in my place. You need to make sure idols don't crowd me out. You need to, to remember, I'm going to know your name, and I'm, I'm going to respect that, and you should honor and know my name and respect my name, because you can't love me well and take my name lightly. Let's spend time together. Sabbath is really important. There's, there's rhythm and rest. Rhythm and rest. Rhythm and rest. You know, the chaoticness of a culture isn't, uh, isn't just a current issue. It's been an issue for a long time. Rhythm and rest. Uh, parents matter. Honor them. Respect them. It's good for, for a society that's productive. Um, doesn't help to be rebellious and hateful towards your parents. By the way, I want to just say that doesn't mean that there aren't boundaries in the adult relationship with parents. Don't commit murder. That'd be a bad idea if we want to have a good relationship. It'd be a bad idea to, have, to commit adultery. Don't do that. That just leads to a whole, a whole bunch of hurt. It, it would really be profitable if you don't steal things that aren't yours. And I, and I think if you would be a truth teller and not bear false witness, that would go better for everybody, us included, me and you. Don't be a liar. And then today, it's such an interesting command. You shall not covet. Would you say the word covet? covet. One more time. Yeah, good. Don't do that. I'd like to say amen and let's just go home, but here's the issue. This is the sin that we joke about in the church and rarely ever take seriously. In my time in ministry for 24 years or so, I've had a lot of people say things and confess things to me and, and, and really be, be messed up. Like, I've got to tell you this. I need to get it out of me and I need you to hear it. They, they've confessed a lot of things. And I'm telling you, the, the spectrum's really broad. If you're in this long enough, you'll hear things from people that, that make you, you, you carry that. I've had people confess murder to me. I've had people confess adultery um, with, I, I'm just telling you, you hear a lot of it, but you know what I've never heard? In my life of ministry, you know what I've never heard in my life? I've never had one person in our churches come up and say, Pastor, I'm really struggling with coveting. Not one. Now, that's not a judgment against you. It's a judgment against probably all of us. I've, I don't know that I've confessed it either to anybody. How's that? I think we're all in it together, right? Why? Because it's the one that nobody else has to really know about, and it's also the one that we can, we can let fly under the radar and, and almost call it godly, this coveting idea. It's interesting and a little bit terrifying. How many of you remember the first thing you ever coveted in your life? Anybody remember the first thing that you consciously coveted, like, Okay, well, I'll, I'll just confess. Um, it was either 1977 or 1978, uh, a day or two after Christmas, I coveted my friend's 
Atari 2600 video game console. Now, some of you here are going to be like, um, I need to go to the Smithsonian so I can see it in person. All right. I get it. I mean, it was so cool, this video game console, breakthrough technology, right? Frogger, Donkey Kong, Pac-Man, you had the cassettes, and, and when they didn't work, you right, and put them back in. I mean, it was exercise, it was respiratory, it was a lot going on. Instead, that Christmas, I got this really lame game called the Atari First Version, First Edition Atari. Anybody remember what the first edition of Atari was? Pong. You had these two sides of the screen, and you had this little ball, beep, beep, beep. I mean, right? I'm so ADD. That lasted like two minutes. I'm like, this is the worst Christmas. Now, had I not known that there was a different Atari system that was way cooler, I think I probably would have been able to appreciate Pong. Maybe. I mean, it would have lasted more than two minutes. You guys are better at this than I am, evidently. I still struggle. Um, I was telling Melissa yesterday, I'm like, you know what, I, if, if money weren't an issue, I would. That's how it all starts, by the way, right? Anybody else? Anybody else dream with fake money? Yeah, me too. I've got a whole list of fake money dreams. Yeah, if money weren't an issue, I'd buy one of those new four-door Jeep Wrangler Sports. And I would get it in burnt orange with black. I mean, I've thought way too much about this. <laughs> and then you know what? The truck I'm driving, which is paid for and very, I mean, it's, I've named him Dwight after the office because he's dependable and sturdy and not really flashy. It, it's the, my ridge line, right? It's drab hunter green, but it's, it, it's versatile. It gets me everywhere I want to go and it runs great. And as a matter of discipline, I'm going to drive it until it's not good. And I want you to hold me accountable to that because, see, I'm a gearhead. I like things that are fast, and I like things that are cool. And that can get me. Anybody else ride a motorcycle? Yep. It's really easy. Bikers make the dumbest decisions about coveting. That's right. I'm preaching to my friends. You know what I do? I love to ride. It's so fun. I just, I got this... I got this Heritage Softail Classic from a buddy. Yeah, I bought it with 4,000 miles. It's an 08. I was able to pay cash for it. And it, it's a much bigger bike, right? I'm like in the grandpa bike now um, from the other bike I had. And, and it's, you know, I can ride farther. It doesn't hurt as much, right? There's just a lot to it. And when I got it, I was so grateful. Melissa's like, finally, you, you're going to just like it the way it is, right? And I'm like, yeah. And now I'm like, I went on a few rides with some pals and they've got new bikes right? And all of a sudden, I'm like, you know, behind them, and I'm like, man, those taillights are so sharp. Look at those streamlined saddlebags. They wrap the muffler. That's so cool. Wow. They've got a radio. And pretty soon, I'm like, I'm not even able to enjoy the ride because I'm really just wishing, like, how can I get Melissa to uh, start selling blood plasma so I can get a new bike, right? It's all that. Maybe you guys are better at this than I am. But I've got to hold that in check. Because if I let that go far, pretty soon it becomes toxic to my joy. Why would God put this here? Why would he wait until the end? Well, let me read the rest of the verse. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. Well, that's easy. I don't really think their houses are much better than mine. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. That's easy. They're all older. You shall not. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm reading this to you as a North American reads it. I'm reading it not as I read it, but this is how our culture filters this. I mean, it's funny, but it's tragic. Does that make any sense so far? Laughter's good, but I want you to get, get the context or his manservant or maidservant. Well, I don't have any of them. His ox or his donkey. Or anything. Will you say the word anything? anything. Hmm, that stings. Anything belonging to your neighbor. Now see, here's how we North Americanize this. We think it's people that live by us. Here's what the biblical connotation of neighbor is. It's anybody around you. 
to anybody around you, your neighbor. Whoever I'm in close proximity to at any given time, that's my neighbor. That changes things. Changes how we view it. You know what happens when I start coveting things that other people have, like their house? Pretty soon, I want to make trades into into payments that, that can really put my family in jeopardy. Or I'm tempted to seek my own comfort and my own fulfillment at the expense of living in God's economy. Listen, if you have a lot of luxurious things, so much so that you can't live in God's economy and honor Him, I want you to know God's not going to be for that. Well, we're in church. He's preaching about money. No, I'm preaching about your freedom. There's a big difference. See, what, what God doesn't need, you know what I don't need for my kids? I don't need for them to pay their car insurance. I don't need them to do that. By the grace of God, we're at a place that I don't need them. Does that make sense? I'm still able, Melissa and I, to provide shelter, food, clothing, all that stuff. I don't need them to do it. I don't need them to contribute for their phone bill. You know why there's pieces of this puzzle at work? Because it's good for them. Does it make sense? God's economy is good for me. God doesn't need me to, I mean, right, on on a global scale of things, it would be so ridiculous to think that 10% and then tithes and offerings coming through our funnel would really change the whole world. But you know what happens when we live in that economy of God? It begins to change my whole world. That's the freedom. And when I get to coveting, it's really easy for me to want to take on payments thinking that'll make me happy. You only got to get to about four payments. And all of a sudden you're like, man, that was stupid. Or you only need to get to the point where, you know, You've committed the sin of adultery, and now you're watching the collateral damage to go, that was so stupid. The thrill of that hunt for fulfillment left me miserable, and it's hurt everybody around me, right? And some of us in this very room, we we could testify to the fact that I'm, I'm grateful that God can restore us, and I get it, but there's a reason that God makes this so specific right now. If you don't remember anything else, I hope you can walk away with this as it, as it is true to this guardrail, this commandment. Contentment simplifies. Coveting complicates. Contentment can simplify my life. Coveting really complicates my life. It's interesting, in the, in the first five books of the Old Testament called the Torah, it's the Jewish books of the law, there are 613 um, applications for how to really do this relationship. God is saying it's really important that we do this well, so here's some things, right, that extrapolate from the, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and of all 613, there's only one that legislates or seeks to guardrail your thoughts, and it's this Tenth Commandment. Isn't that interesting? Everything, it's interesting what God's doing right here is he's making, uh, he, he's making a distinction and a connection. A distinction between our thoughts and our actions and the connecting of how they go together. All right, I'm going to pretend like you really got that one. It's interesting. See, we think our thoughts are secret. And they are to everybody but God. He knows our thoughts. Right? When Jesus heals a paralytic, remember the story? The friends, don't you all want friends that are so, their faith is so so strong that they'll rip off somebody's roof to get you in front of Jesus? Hey, destruction of property in guardrails. Just so, anyway. But they get him there, and they're lowering him down, and Jesus sees him, and the kid, you're right, the paralytic is eyeball to eyeball with Jesus at some place in the story, and he's been laying on a mat, right? I mean, how incredible is this? Beautiful. And what does Jesus say? Your sins are forgiven. And then what does Jesus say? The Bible says, knowing what the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were thinking, Who is he to forgive sin? What's Jesus say next? See, Jesus knows your thoughts. That's the whole point. 
The Father knows our thoughts. But we think that our thoughts can be kept secret and it's not going to be a problem. But God's saying it's clearly a problem because it's your thought that leads to your action. And the action of your life leads to the consequences you live with. And often your thought is the action. That's what Jesus made really clear in the Sermon on the Mount, right? If you go back and listen to any of the new narrative series that we did for six months. Often our thought is the action. Why? Because God wants our heart. God wants your heart, not just your stuff. Anyway, coveting happens when? When I let my heart be set on people or possessions that aren't meant for me. I covet. When I let my heart be set on people or possessions that are not meant for me, I covet. Does that make sense? Now, I want to make a distinction here. Having ambition and desire is not anti-Bible. You know, we moved here from Georgia to start this church 15 years ago because we had the ambition and the desire to follow after God, and it was a big dream, and it was going to require a lot of stuff. Right? It's not like we did this, but our role was, was taking the step. But there was, it's not wrong to have nice things. It's not wrong to want nice things. It's wrong to let nice things have you and the want for nice things to have you. Amen. It's when it begins to compete with your passion. And that's when, that's when things get sideways, right? In 1 Kings chapter 21, we, you can read the story of Ahab and Jezebel and Naboth. Naboth had a vineyard in Jezreel. It was near the king's palace. And King Ahab, and by the way, it says there was no, there was no king more vile or wicked than Ahab. Ahab wanted his vineyard because it was near proximity. He wanted to make it a vegetable garden. So he goes to, to Naboth and said, hey, um, I'll trade you another vineyard. I'll trade you one that's better. I'll give you an upgrade, just I want yours. Um, Or if you want me just to buy it, I'll buy it. Tell me the price. And Naboth said, you know, um, I can't do that. This was my my father's, you know, this is passed on. This is the inheritance. Here's what's happening. Naboth understands that this is valuable, but he also understands that he wants to pass it forward to the next generation. That's what he's saying. So what's, what's Ahab do? Uh, the king of Israel, he goes home and he starts to pout. And he won't eat. And he's in his bed and it says, staring at the wall. Like he's seven. And his wife, Jezebel, there's not a more wicked woman in the Bible than Jezebel. Matter of fact, in Revelation it says, the spirit of Jezebel is still alive and seeks to destroy the church. Anyway, You can read about that stuff if you want. One of my greatest fears in America today in the church is the illiteracy of the body. I don't want us to be that way, so I'll I'll hang out for a while in places that are awkward. Cool? So Jezebel goes to her husband Ahab, and she says, well, what's the matter? Why are you pouting? I'm paraphrasing greatly. You can read it for yourself. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one before you leave. And he said, Naboth won't sell me his vineyard, and I'm really sad about it. (laughs) And she said, well, let's not be sad about that. We can fix it. So what does she do? She sets two people up to bear false witness against Naboth, saying that he was blaspheming the Lord and blaspheming the king. And so what happens? They drag him out and they stone him to death. The stoning was different than the kind of stoning you hear about today with the legalization of things. Sorry, I'm not right. (laughs) Jezebel hears that it all had been executed the way she had conspired, and she goes back to her husband, and she says, Hey, uh, Naboth's dead. You You can go get the vineyard now. And he does. And you know what God did? God sent his prophet. And God sent sent his prophet Elijah, and he gets there, and he says, uh, hey, you know, how is it? You like this? You murdered to get it. And the consequences, 
we're graven for the next generation. Not good. You get to, uh, you know, David's story, 2 Samuel chapter 11. You guys remember that story? Remember when King David, it was the time when all the kings went out to war, but for some reason the king of Israel decided to stay home? There was a beginning to a flaw in leadership. A flaw in leadership is a slow fade that has fast consequences when it's found out. And he was living in that. The slow fade brought fast consequences. He's walking around on the roof of the palace. He's looking around. He sees a lady who's bathing on the roof of her house because that was customary in that time. That's how you would heat water, right? You put it on top of your your clay roof, it would help, right? So that's, that's the why. And at, in the evening, you, you would think that there's some privacy. But David catches a glimpse of something that's off limits to him. And what's he do next? It's off limits, but I want it. I shouldn't do it, but I have to. Doesn't matter what you think, God. You have to go through a lot of checks in your spirit to get to where David was. That's the Lord calling to say amen. amen. <laughs> I forget to silence my phone all the time. I was preaching a funeral once, and all of a sudden I hear a phone ring, and uh, I, I hear, hello, hello, and it's, I think, my daughter's voice, and it's Melissa sitting right in the middle of the funeral. <laughs> Love you, baby. Why am I telling you that? We all have human issues. They're here, right? So I'm not shaming anybody. <laughs> David sends for Bathsheba. He sleeps with her. She sends word, I'm pregnant. David sends for her husband, who was a good man, who was fighting the battle on David's behalf. David tries to cover it up. The husband has far more integrity and commitment than David ever thought about in that moment. So David conspires to have him killed and make it look like an accident. All those things might be covered up to everybody but Jesus. The father sees. Why is he saying don't covet? Because coveting leads to wrong action. Coveting, coveting sets, it, it, it moves the governor of your heart. Your true north is now skewed. Coveting makes almost north seem good enough. When we covet, we start to make excuses, and that's what David did. And, of course, you can read the results. They weren't good. I'm grateful that God, God doesn't let your pain be wasted if you repent. God doesn't let your mess stay a mess. He can redeem it for a message because we serve the God of of, of justice and righteousness and mercy and redemption, and he recycles our pain, and he gives it a purpose. Aren't you grateful for that? But it doesn't mean all the consequences just magically go away. The Bible is replete with illustrations of consequence for disobedience. Second thing, coveting happens when sin becomes a consideration to obtain what I don't have. If you want to know if you're coveting, ask yourself, what have I been willing to, to do to acquire that which I don't have? And if sin has ever been a part of the equation, you are endangering your soul. Does that make sense? In James chapter 4, he talks to this. James, the half-brother of Jesus, it's pretty interesting. James didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah until the resurrection. He was a late adopter. It'd be hard for me to believe my brother was all that special, too. No? You guys all? I'll just get back to this. Chapter 4, verse 1 of James. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? What causes the issue with other people? It really has to do with what's happening inside you, not what's happening around you. That's why it's so necessary to understand what's happening in me. It's easy for me to, to identify what's happening around me to try to justify what's happening in me, right? That, it's really important. 
what James is saying, understand what's happening in you because what's happening around you is not nearly as important as what's happening in you. Anyway, that's a sermon in itself. You're welcome. You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet. But you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You don't have it because your heart's wrong. You don't have it because your motive is to get things that make your plan come together, often at the expense of God's plan, which is to renovate your heart. We can't live fully alive in the assignment of the kingdom that God has for each of us if I'm constantly trying to negotiate God onto my agenda. I can't live fully alive in the assignment that God has for me if I'm constantly trying to negotiate God to, in, into my agenda, like he's got to adopt my, my will. You ever have kids that constantly want, I mean, kids are master negotiators, right? It doesn't take long for children to become master manipulators. When I would say this when our kids were little, Melissa would really like, that's not, they're so lovely. And I'm like, and terrorist. <laughs> we can't negotiate with the terrorist side of our children. Some of the moms are really judging me hard right now. I, I love our children dearly. And I love your children. My favorite place to hang out in this church is right down that hallway where world changers are being, being encouraged. However, there is this place where kids, they will constantly nag you and complain and try really hard to get you as parents to give up what you know is right so that they can have what they want, even when you know what they want is not best for them. So a good parent is, is judicious not to cave. Listen, the best thing you can do as parents is to be on, on page as spouses. Be a team. Understand that guardrails are needed. I love to give our kids gifts that are meaningful for them and that, and that they light up. I love it. But I never want to give them the wrong gift at the, at the wrong time or the right gift at the wrong time. You know what the right gift at the wrong time looks like? It looks like a 16-year-old kid getting a 69 Chevelle with a 350 four-barrel super glide transmission posi traction rear end. Amen. Just because he's 16 and, and earned his license, you know the problem with that? His maturity matches a moped. <laughs> right? But what they want, and get it, I'm, I'm down, man. I like all things fast. I'm not going to be your guy in a Prius. <laughs> but you get the, because, right, the, the kid, what I want, and I want it, and the dad somewhere attaches to this, yeah, I did too at that age, and I didn't get it because he had better parents, and, and I'm going to get it for you. <laughs> Listen, if I'm preaching at you, just realize I love you. But... <laughs> But here's the problem. That kid's going to get behind the wheel, and he's not going to realize that you need to accelerate just a little bit in a curve for, for centrifugal force. He's going to accelerate too much, and he's going to hit a guardrail, or he's going to spin out. Or Does that make sense? Yeah. Here's the problem. We so often what we want what God knows we're not ready for, and that's what James is saying. We God doesn't want to give us the wrong thing for our growth. Because when God gives us the wrong thing for our growth, it stunts us. It doesn't grow us. And we live in a culture of chasing instead of stretching. The love of God stretches us. It stretches us. But we live in a culture 
that distracts us with chasing, that says more is more. The Bible I read says less can be more. Now, does that mean you can't have nice things? doesn't mean that at all. Does that mean that, that you can't have wealth and a funded retirement? It doesn't mean that at all. What it does mean is don't let it have you. Don't let it have you. Anything that you close your fist and say, God, I'm not willing for you to have that and use that or, or give it to somebody else is an idol in your life. And coveting will, will lead you to chase a lot of idols. Some of you are like, yeah, I wish he would have just stopped at amen in the beginning. I know. You know, coveting happens when an, when an otherwise morally neutral desire becomes the controlling force of my contentment. That's coveting. When an otherwise morally neutral desire becomes the driving force of my contentment, I begin to covet. I begin to think I know better than God. <coughs> Coveting leads to this. One, it leads to resentment. It leads you to resentment. We no longer have appreciation for what we've been given. Coveting leads to compromise. Coveting leads us to, to begin chasing for things we don't have instead of trusting that God knows everything we need. And that in his time, if we, if we are are seeking him doesn't mean you shouldn't work hard. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks a lot about work ethic. I think Christians should be should be the best employees on the planet. I think Christians should should as believers, followers of Jesus, we should really honor him and people should see it by the way we do work. But when I compromise, I begin to chase instead of trust. When I compromise, I begin to extend instead of save. Does that make any sense? Third thing coveting leads to, it leads to soul sickness. Because we now, we have a, a list of idols that will elevate in front of God as we can attain them. They may not last long, but they don't have to to bring the consequence. Amen, Pastor. I'm so glad that I came to church to be encouraged after the Buckeyes got beat. You're welcome. Contentment, it simplifies. Coveting complicates. I love what Paul says. Paul wrote the vast majority of the New Testament. By the time Paul's writing the, the letter to the Philippians, and by the time he's penning these words in Philippians chapter 4, he has been really um, wounded in the process of, of following Jesus so that he could make this statement. He, I mean, you don't, you, it's easy to be poetic and write things, but this is birthed out of experience. You know, I, I'm not interested in everybody's opinion. I'm interested in their experience. Matter of fact, if you don't have experience in something, your opinion's just idealistic. And the further you are removed from any, any real scenario, the easier it is to be an idealist, right? Paul's not an idealist. Paul is he's testifying. He's like, oh, man, I get it. So let's, I'll just read it for you. I'm not saying this because I'm in need. What he's, look, so the church and the Philippian church, they were the earliest adopters of all the churches he planted that had a heart to be generous and care for helping other churches hear the gospel that were not yet in existence. That's what he's saying, okay? I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content. Will you say content? Yes. Whatever, man, that's such a big word. I looked it up in the Greek. It's all-encompassing. I, I want a clause there. I've learned to be content, except, that's not what he says, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret. Now, the guy who penned more books of the Bible 
by himself in the New Testament than anybody else is saying he's learned the secret. We should pay attention. This is good. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Doesn't matter if I'm dehydrated or if I just had a porterhouse steak. I've learned the secret. It's not about my belly. I've learned the secret. If I have a place to pillow my head or if I have to sleep on the desert floor, I've learned the secret. That's what he's saying. I've learned the secret. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. I can do anything. I can, it doesn't matter. See, I've learned the secret, and the secret is that the God of the universe, Jesus who became flesh, the one who I was trying to persecute people because they were associated with him, I've learned this incredible secret that it wasn't about this ladder I was trying to climb to become known and to get to this position because, see, coveting has everything to do with this primary root of sin that the enemy weaves into the tapestry of our life so cleverly that it feels normal. It's this. It's destination disease. Coveting leads you to destination disease. What's destination disease? It's this. I'll be happy when. I'll be fulfilled when. When we make the house larger or when I get the opportunity for the raise I deserve. Paul's saying, I've learned the secret. I've learned the secret in how to be content when I get passed over at work. I've learned the secret in how to be content with, with the car I drive. I've learned the secret in how to be content in the house I have. I've learned the secret in how to be content, and I can do all of it in Jesus. Like if I, if I if through Jesus, he's, he's working in me, all of a sudden what's around me isn't tempting me to, to chase. He's just going to lead me. And I can do it. It's a secret. It's a secret that, that he knows what I need, and he wrote the assignment, and it's so good. Man, I've learned the secret. The problem is I need to learn the secret over and over again. Jesus said every day we should reconnect to the true secret that Paul's talking about. Every day, take up your cross. Every day, follow me. Any day that I don't intentionally lean into Jesus, I am tempted to covet. That's just reality. Parents, have you ever wished your kids would be like somebody else's kids? Don't answer that with a hand. Because I already know the truth. The enemy will rob whatever joy we have when we let our eyes drift. The Hebrew writer, some say it was Paul, others say it was Apollos. We don't know for sure who wrote the book of Hebrews. He said this in chapter 12. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. The author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. You know, Jesus wasn't very really excited about the cross. You realize that? Yeah. I mean, we romanticize his agony. We also romanticize the agony of Mary and Joseph and everybody else this time of year. But anyway, we romanticize the agony of the cross. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is going, man, you know what? Um, oh, do I really? I, I get it. There's not another way. But if there were another way, that's the Garden of Gethsemane message. So when the Hebrew writer says, let's fix our eyes on the one who modeled how to do it well, have the long view. Have the long view and pain that is temporary will stay temporary because we start to set our eyes, fix our gaze. The secret's Jesus. I want to know that secret. I want to know that secret. I need to remind myself of that secret. And I get a paycheck to follow Jesus. You know, when I say that kind of statement, it only makes most other pastors uncomfortable. But it's not lost on me. It's a high calling to lead his bride. It's a, it, it's a dangerous calling to lead his bride. 
Does that make sense? I don't take it lightly, but I'm human like you. But you know what I don't see? I don't see a different set of commandments for me other than you. His high calling is obedience. His high calling is this relationship. His high calling is leaning in to this incredible relationship that begins to calibrate our heart and bring true freedom. But I can't do that if I'm chasing the wrong things. That's why he says coveting is a really bad idea. Coveting, coveting is the gateway sin to so many other sins. Paul says, I know the secret. There's an old hymn. Some of you... Uh, how many of you were here when this place was still Northwest Evangelical Christian Church? Would you raise your hand? And y'all are heroes to me. Got one of the hymnals. Keep them in my eye. I've got, a, I've got several different types of, you know, different hymnals. But this is the one that came with the church. And I like the theology in this particular hymn. 545, I lost my place marker. Johnson Oatman Jr. wrote this to remind himself, and I think it'll be familiar for some of you. When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings. Every doubt will fly. And you'll be singing as the days go by. When you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings. Money cannot buy. Your reward in heaven nor your home on high. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged. God is over all. Count your many blessings. Angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. And then the chorus, right? Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. Count your many. Anyway. You know, that song is outdated today. Like right on the, on the playlist, it's, it's truncated. It's theology is spot on. The cadence of that song was meant to get into our soul. The cadence of that, of that tempo was meant to be remembered. It's meant to fix our gaze on the Christ. I love singing about how great God is. But sometimes I have to be reminded that my eyes should be fixed. Right. And when, I, when I'm tempted to covet, I need to be reminded. Mm -hmm. Paul in the Philippian letter, here's what he's doing. He's telling the church he loves. It'd be like if I'm writing a letter to you. That's what he's writing to, the church in Philippi. The founding pastor he said into the church, I found the secret. I've taken the stairs. You can take the elevator. You don't have to be shipwrecked and left for dead, snake bitten. You don't have to be abandoned. You don't have to be imprisoned. The secret's Jesus. It may lead to all those things, but man, if it does, it's so good. We live in a day and age where the gospel has become so palatable it is no longer powerful. I don't want a palatable gospel that is comforting to my circumstances and not growing to my soul. I don't want that. I mean, I want it, but I don't really want that. You know, your kids at a certain age will want cereal for every meal or hot dogs, which I think are engineered straight from Satan. 
I've never had a time in my life where I'm like, you know, life would be better with one more hot dog. <laughs> if you ever read what goes into hot dogs, you quit eating them too. But we serve them around here. We're, we're that passive aggressive. <laughs> I never know, is it going to be a sermon? Anyway. See, I, if we just gave our kids what they cried for, the outcome would be undesirable. Amen. If we just make the gospel, if we just make the word of God so soft and so palatable, we rob it of its intended power for the transformation of our life that brings the true freedom of expression that gives me the ability to face life when it's tempest-tossed. gives me the ability, I hope, all the days of my life to count my blessings. 